So my name is Trishul Chalimbi, and I'm going to talk about Project Atom, which is an effort to build an efficient and scalable deep learning training system. And this is joint work with my colleagues at Microsoft, Yutaka, Karthik, and Johnson. So many of us first heard about deep learning probably when we saw an article in the New York Times about two years ago, uh, which talked about progress in deep learning. And one of the applications highlighted was a real-time English to Mandarin speech translation demo that Rick Rashid, who was the head of Microsoft Research at the time, gave. Um, so that seemed very exciting. But before I go and talk about what's deep learning, let's step back one level and what's really machine learning. So machine learning is something that takes a lot of data. It has smart humans look at the data and come up with handcrafted features. These handcrafted features are fed to a classifier, and there are a wide variety of classifiers. You talk to machine learning experts, they say, no, no, SVMs or something else, boosted decision trees. But you give these handcrafted features to a classifier along with an objective function, and what you get is a prediction. And what the classifier is really learning is it's using statistics to find correlations. So where does deep learning fit in this picture? So the way deep learning fits in this picture is it goes one step further and says, well, we don't really need humans to supply the features. All we need is the data, and you tell us the task we want to learn on it, and the deep learning system will automatically extract the best features for this task. So, so where is deep learning appropriate, or what are the problems it's good at? So I think there's a wide spectrum of machine learning problems, ranging all the way from what we call core AI to something more like data mining. So what is core AI? It's standard you know, vision, speech, document understanding. And data mining is more things that we actually see quite often, movie recommendation systems. What's the difference between the two, and why is deep learning good at one and not so suitable for the other? And the real difference is uh, the core AI tasks, it turns out it's hard to specify representations of features. Whereas for the data mining tasks or the tasks on the other side of the spectrum, it's easy to come up with good representations of features. Like for movies, it's, well, what's the user demographics? What have they watched? That's easy to come up with. For vision, if I'm trying to recognize objects in an image, it's not clear to me like what kind of combination of pixel values might be good features. Uh, and so for core AI problems where specifying representation is hard, deep learning turns out to be state of the art. And for the other end of the spectrum where you have data mining and it's easy to come up with representations, you'll probably get no benefit from deep learning at all. Okay, so, so deep learning, and I'm gonna talk about deep neural nets. So what are neural nets and what are deep neural nets? So neural nets are a model of computation that's kind of model on how we think the brain works, where you have these computing elements called neurons that take multiple inputs and produce an output. And the way the system learns or the network learns is it modifies the weights on its connections to generate the right output value that gives the prediction you want. So if I have, and, and the way a deep neural net differs from a shallow neural net is you just have multiple levels of neurons stacked one on top of the other. And so here's an example where I have, say, a speech input, and that's given to the first level of this deep neural net. And what it happens is it learns some low-level features, and as you go higher and higher up the network, it learns higher and higher features until the final output gives you what you really desire. And the really interesting thing about deep learning is the network learns these complex, intermediate, hierarchical representations from the data without you actually specifying what you want these representations to be. Now, for speech, it's hard to kind of understand what these mid-level representations are, so let's look at vision. So here's an example of a, a deep neural net for vision, and you can examine what the intermediate layers learn, and what you find is, well, the first layer learns something like edge detection. The next layer learns to identify something more complex like textures. Uh, the next layer identifies more complex features like shapes. And as you go higher and higher up, the top level, actually individual neurons respond to what we consider high-level concepts. Like there's a neuron that could respond to faces. And Ross Goshek and his colleagues at Berkeley did some nice work to show that, you know, actually these top-level neurons do respond to individual high-level concepts. So now you're saying, okay, this all looks really cool, uh, but there must be a cat somewhere, one. And then why am I talking about this at OSDI? Shouldn't I be at NIPS or something? 
so so um, so 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 here's why I'm talking about this at OSDI and why it's a systems problem. What's really holding us back with deep learning? So if you have really really complex tasks like you know vision for example or trying to understand documents, it turns out the size of the model you need to be able to do a good job at this task grows pretty much linearly with the complexity of the task, okay? Uh, but that's not so bad. But then what happens is, as you have larger and larger models, to be able to train the model to extract these features automatically, you need kind of a linear amount of data as well. So when you put these two things together, you actually find that the complexity of the task implies you kind of have to have not only large models, but large amounts of data. And so it's like a quadratic thing where you multiply these two things. And so the result is you need a prodigious amount of computation. So here's an example of kind of how much computation you need to do a good job at vision or speech recognition. And so you really need the order of petaflops of computing. And so now that's not something I can do in a single box. I really need a large scale distributed systems. Uh, so that, 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 that's one motivation. But the other thing that's also really interesting and exciting for the systems community is, so this has been known, you know, you have these models. As you give it more and more data, what you find is the accuracy on your task also improves. So you don't have to come up with new algorithms or anything. It's just the same task. Just give it more data and your accuracy improves. And what we have also shown with this work is, it's not just the, the amount of data you give it, but the size of the model. So you can also improve accuracy by training larger models. So that's really exciting for system persons. I don't have to come up with a new machine learning algorithm. If I can build a powerful enough system and just train larger models on more data, I can get better accuracy. OK, so let me talk about the system we built called Atom. And at a high level, there are three important pieces. Uh, you have to provide data to the system. And it's not a question of just serving data at high throughput because you have to do a lot of transformations to the data. For example, if I have images, I might want to translate the image or rotate it to, provide, uh, to prevent the system from trying to over-specialize to my training data. Because learning is not so much an optimization problem where you want to specialize to the, or overfit to your training data, but it's more about a generalization problem where I want to learn a robust model that'll do well on unseen data that's drawn from the same distribution. So the data server is important, and then the heart of the system is where I train the model. And training the model involves you know, executing, uh, executing inputs, seeing what the error on those inputs are, and using the error to update the weights. And ultimately, the model is stored as kind of this combination of trained weights that's stored on a parameter server. And everything needs to be scalable. You don't want bottlenecks in any, any part of the system. So what does the overall architecture look like? So, uh, to be able to do this at large scale, you want to have both model parallelism and data parallelism. Uh, and so model parallelism means what I'm going to do is I'm going to train really large models. They're not going to fit on individual machines. So I need to split them over multiple machines and have them kind of execute in parallel. And data parallelism means I have a lot of, uh, a, a large data set, and I want to split it up into pieces that I can independently train on, on, on in parallel. And so you have multiple model replicas, each consisting of multiple machines that train on different subsets of the data. And the way they all kind of learn the same model rather than diverging is you have a global parameter store where they publish uh, their updates to the model and get snapshots that have been updated by the other replicas. So that's the overall system. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the key uh, optimizations we had to do in Atom to get this system to be efficient and scale well. And the paper has many more uh, optimizations as well. So one of the things is on a single machine, you want to kind of maximize the performance you can get. Because if I want to build a large scale scalable system, it's not just how well it scales, but it's also what's my single box performance. Because that's my baseline for scaling. So in a single machine, I have, you know, what I've shown in yellow is like multiple threads executing on multiple cores, and they're each processing a different input, you know. And this is completely asynchronous. There's no kind of coordination between all of these uh, threads on different cores processing inputs. And the reason all this works is because what they're doing when they process the input is they want to compute an update for a weight. And it turns out that the weight updates are just additions. 
So they're nice. It's, they're associative and commutative, so you can ap apply them in any order, and you don't have to kind of lock the shared weights to make sure that you know, you're not going to have a bad case occurring. So not having locks really en enables us to scale across multiple threads in a single machine. The other thing is, you know, you have these large models, and now you want to partition it across multiple machines. So the question arises is, well, how much of the model can I fit on a single machine? Well, you know, the obvious answer is, well, you definitely don't want it to stream it from disk, so you want it to fit in memory, right? Because you want to take advantage of memory bandwidth. It turns out that, uh, you know, putting a piece of, uh, of the model that to fit in memory is not sufficient because memory bandwidth is still a bottleneck in the system. So you actually want to go one level lower and say, well, can I fit the working set of the model in the L3 cache? So now that's going to involve you splitting the, the model over multiple machines, but the benefit you get is on each machine, the speed is significantly higher because you're not bottlenecked by the, the memory bandwidth. So, so less actually is more. Overall, your system is still faster. So that's about getting really good performance on the single machine. What about scaling the entire system? So one of the bottlenecks in the system really is the communication between these model replicas and the parameter server, because you have to periodically publish your parameters and get new values down. And so one thing that helps, so, so, so what happens is a replica publishes updates to the weights there, and it's completely asynchronous. So we're not going to synchronize when these things publish the updates. They're going to appear in any order. And the other thing we're going to do is we could treat this as a pure key value store. When we see a new update, just apply it. But then we'd be limited in throughput. What we can do is, because the weight updates, again, are associative and commutative, we can keep aggregating them. And then kind of in a very spatially local manner, when we have a large enough aggregation, then apply them. And this asynchronous batching uh, gives a, a, a huge improvement in kind of the scalability of the system. And then the other thing we can do is, uh, so when you send weight updates up, to compute a weight update, uh, there, it's, a, it's a combination of three things. There's a constant parameter called the learning rate. And there's an error gradient you have computed on this particular input. And the third component is, well, what were the activations or what were the outputs of the neurons uh, for, the, for this input? And so you compute the, the weight update on the machine and then you send these updates up. The problem is the, the, the volume of data you send up, the weights, is order n square, where n is the number of neurons in your system. Instead, what you can do is say, well, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send this, uh, because the, the learning rate is a constant, I can kind of know that ahead of time. But what I'm going to send is I'm going to send the individual vectors that correspond to the error gradients and the weight updates. And I'm going to do the computation on those machines. And so this is going to significantly reduce the communication from order n square to order k times n. And k is because you don't want to send updates for individual examples, but you want to batch them and send them in a batch. So, so, but k is significantly lower than the number of neurons in your system. So that dramatically reduces the, the communication. It also has the nice side effect of offloading computation from these model training machines that are doing a lot of computation and sending it to these parameter server machines, which really don't do much computation. They have free cycles, because they're just aggregating and storing data. And so it, it, it fits very nicely. So, so really, at a high level, and there's more optimizations in the paper, all the optimization kind of fall in two broad categories. One is like, you know, you, you're doing this whole system co-design for this application of training a deep learning system. And then you're exploiting asynchrony to make sure the system is efficient and scales well. So now let's dive into some uh, performance analysis. How well does this work? You know, how good are the models it trains? And all the data I'm going to show you is while running the system training, the largest publicly available vision benchmark we could get our hands on, it's something called ImageNet 22000. And the idea is, given an image, can you recognize the object in the image? And the object is going to be one among 22,000 different categories. So it's a really hard task. There's a lot of training data available. There's about 14 million labeled images. And to give you a sense of how hard the task is, you know, there's thousands of breeds of different dogs. You're required to distinguish between an American foxhound and an English foxhound. There's hundreds of different varieties of, of plants and 
Uh, so it, it's really hard. I mean, I do very poorly on this benchmark, and I think most of us would. So, so, so how does the model size scale? So like I said, less is more. You know, you want to size the model across machines so that the working set fits in the L3 cache. And one nice effect of this is, as I've shown you, like on the y-axis, I have size of the model in terms of billions of connections. As I add more machines, I actually see a super linear speed up. So it's not just linear. And the reason it's super linear is because the working set of these models grows sublinearly, not linearly. And because like a lot of it is sparse. And so by kind of just making, the, making sure the working set fits in, in L3 cache, you get dramatic speed improvements. And it scales really well. OK, so then the other thing is the parameter server performance. So if all I do is I send, I compute my weights on the training machines and send the weight vectors up, the problem is, you know, uh, I'm showing you performance of an individual parameter server machine as I increase the number of cores in terms of how many updates the second I can do. And you notice that if all I'm doing is sending weight updates over the network, I'm really limited by my network bandwidth. Now we have a pretty fast 20 GBS, 20 gigabits per second connection between the machines, but that's still about you know 500 million of updates per second. So that's what I'm limited at. It doesn't matter how many cores I have. So to experiment, we said, well, what if we could magically kind of make sure the weights were local on that machine, and we take the network out of the equation? Then how much could we get performance? And what you notice is you get a linear increase up to about eight cores, and then it tapers off. And what happens at eight cores is you hit the memory bandwidth bottleneck on the machine. Now instead, if we did what I said, and we're going to offload the computation so that you do it locally on the parameter server machines, now the volume of communication is significantly less, and you get fairly good speed up. So we can go all the way up to about uh, 13 billion parameter updates per second at 16 nodes. Uh, and it's scaling pretty well. But the network is still a little bit of the bottleneck. And so you know, if we could kind of magically take the network out of the equation, we would get slightly better scaling, and we could get up to 20 billion parameter updates per second. But you know, that's not possible with our current networking. OK, so you know, these are individual pieces of the system. But what's really interesting is how well does the overall system scale when you're actually doing the task? And so this is what this is showing on the on the y-axis, I'm showing you speed in terms of connection strain per second as you add more and more machines. And the dashed line there is a, a scenario where you have kind of no parameter server. I mean, it's, not, it's kind of an ideal hypothetical scenario because you're not going to learn in that situation. Each model replica is going to independently learn a different model that you can't reconcile in any way. But it's used to show that our actual system with the parameter server scales really well. Uh, it's definitely there's an overhead there, but the scaling is pretty linear. We get about 70x speed up uh, when you go to about 88 machines. So that's not too bad. OK, so what about the accuracy of the model strained? So before looking at the accuracy of the overall system, what we wanted to do was evaluate the accuracy on a smaller task. So, you know, like machine learning 101, there's this benchmark called MNIST. And it's an old benchmark. It's fairly simple. What it is is it's images of handwritten digits from 0 to 9. And the task is, given one of these handwritten digits, can you identify it as a 0 or a 5 or a 7? Uh, and so this is, you know, a task that machine learning uh, the community still aggressively pursues. You can see the accuracy is really high. Uh, just recently, last year, there was a new technique that improved the accuracy to 99.55%. And this is a very small model. You can run it on a single machine. Small number of examples, you know, just about 50,000 examples. And so our goal here was, can we have a reasonable baseline for our system? I was not interested in implementing every single, you know, machine learning technique to be able to get to this high value, but I want it to be comparable. So I want it to be like you know, a reasonable big and dumb system. And so when we evaluated our single box performance on this benchmark, we found that you know, we were about 99.4%. It's not too bad. It's kind of competitive. Uh, but this was a synchronous version, and Adam was designed to be asynchronous. So it's like, well, how much worse is it going to get with asynchrony? Let's see. So we turned on asynchrony, and lo and behold, uh, we got a huge jump. and 
even better than the top result uh, on that benchmark published. So, so it's really interesting. So the asynchrony gave us a tremendous boost. And if you look at the, the track record on this benchmark, it's like more than like a decade of improvement on that benchmark. And thinking back about it, like why does asynchrony help? And to think about it, this, this is really a space, a non-convex optimization space where you have a lot of local minima. And uh, the asynchrony helps you jump out of these local minima and you can find a better, better minima. So great, so you're not big and dumb, you're actually big and smart. Uh, so how well does the system scale? So it turns out that deep learning really does work for vision. So you know, five years ago, if you gave a system these images, you'd be very lucky if it said one was a dog and another was a penguin. But now, you know, it's these systems are sophisticated enough that they can say, well, you know, that's a cardigan Welsh corgi, and that's an emperor penguin. Actually, that's wrong. So Adam actually gets this right, and that's not a cardigan Welsh corgi, it's a Pembroke Welsh corgi, <laughs> and that's not an emperor penguin, it's a king penguin, but it's hard. Uh, and so, you know, what we have done is we've cre created the world's best photograph classifier for this task with knowledge of 22,000 object categories. And it's twice as accurate as the previous best for this task. And I believe, actually, it's better than human performance on this task, and based on my experience and my colleagues. And if you think you're better, I encourage you, go to the website. The, the picture's available. Try it out. Um, and so, so, so how well does the system do on this task? So to compare, let's compare against random. So random is one out of 22,000, which is terrible. It's like 0.05%, so you can't get by by guessing. So the previous best was about 13.6%. Uh, and this is a very har harsh standard, because if you say American foxhound is an English foxhound, you get zero credit. So you're marked wrong. It's no, no partial credit. And so Lay and all used ImageNet, and they also supplemented their training with YouTube images. And they got slightly better, about 15.8%. And Adam on this task gets close to 30%, which is about twice as accurate as the previous best. So it's a significant improvement. Where does that arise from? So we did an analysis as we increased the size of the models. Uh, and what we found was, as you increase the size of the model, your accuracy does improve. But we looked at the similar size model that Leigh and all had used, and we found that we got a huge jump over, those, over their model, even for the same size model. And our belief is, you know, asynchrony really has contributed to this jump. We can't really validate that by turning off asynchrony because it would take multiple months to train the model without asynchrony. So it's not really a reasonable experiment we can do. All right, uh, I'm done. So to summarize, you know, Atom is a scalable deep learning system. It's built from commodity PCs, and it's very scalable and efficient, you know, based on whole system co-design and exploiting asynchrony. And really, I think there's an opportunity for a systems-driven approach to ML, where you train larger models on more data to get high accuracy. So I'm ready for questions. And while I'm uh, answering questions, I'll put up this challenge image that my boss had given me with a cell phone photo he took in his backyard and saying, feed this to Adam and see what it says. So. So, so we just have time for uh, maybe one or two questions. So let's start with let's start with John, and then uh, maybe we'll take maybe these three, I guess. Hi, John Osterhoff from Stanford. Just a question about the size of the model and the, the shared data set, the the green blobs at the top of your slide. How big are those in terms of bytes? Uh, so, 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 so our parameter servers, the green blobs, are actually shared among uh, multiple models. So in some sense, they're a shared resource that are going to serve multiple models. For individual models, those things could be in the order, depending on the size of the model, could be in the order of terabyte or so. And how many models? Uh, so currently, we do about 20 or 30 models. Thanks. Yeah, we're very interested in RAM clouds. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, real hi. quick. Uh, Ardon Amiri Sani from Rice. Uh, so recently, we've been hearing about this uh, brain-inspired accelerator, such as like IBM True North and Qualcomm MPUs, and I've heard that they have something some, such as uh, 250 million uh, neurons, right? So I was wondering if you have those hardware, how will that change the landscape? Like, is it going to 
help you use less machine, get the same accuracy, or just any ideas? So, 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 so the trick is, you know, like it's, it's great to have these large models. Turns out as you get larger and larger models, they're harder and harder to train. So just because you have this really large model doesn't mean you can train it to good accuracy. So you need a large amount of data, and you know, what we found is like, you know, training small models was easy. It took us months before we could get large models to really train. So I think, you know, it's not a question of I have the hardware and now I can do this, you know, 100 billion model. Look, I'll get good accuracy. In fact, uh, I think Andrew Eng had this paper where he uh, did a cluster of GPUs to train really large models. But what he found was the accuracy for those large models was worse than the accuracy of a smaller model. So I think this, this, we should be cautious about those things. Thank okay. you. Okay, maybe really quick. Yeah. Uh, okay, Mingjie from NYU, and uh, according to my understanding, your architecture is uh, like you partition all the workers into model replicas, and among the model replicas, you use the synchrony, right? So the workers within the model replica will share the same model. So how many machines will be in the model replica? Oh, so, so right now for this task, we just partitioned it among four machines because you know, the input image was 256 by 256. Okay, but I so think that's a function of like, you know, what's your input size, so you can vary that. Okay, so the question is, if you have four machines, and uh, you said that you fit the model layer into the L3 cache of four machines, then the total amount of um, the L3 cache of four machines is less than one GPU memory. No, no, so, so it's not the, so what I said, it's the working set of the model. And so the computation is organized so that you do it layer by layer, and you tile everything so that the working set fits. So, so the model is much bigger than the L3 cache. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. And oh, yes. so, so I don't know how many people got that, but there's a rabbit in the image, and Adam got that. It's, it's right here if you can see that. <laughs>